Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at Grand Avenue Presbyterian in Sherman and First Presbyterian Church in Denison. We're doing things a little differently this morning for some personal reasons. My wife tested positive for the virus, although her symptoms have been extremely mild. She has been in isolation and being near her, um, I'm also in observing some isolation too. So others have recorded other parts of the service for today and I'm recording these parts from home. In our little more relaxed atmosphere, I'm gonna have a little coffee, I invite you to do the same. And then we will worship God together. If you appreciate the service, I invite you to leave a like or an encouraging comment or to share this service with a friend. Let us now worship God. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let us worship God together. The one who calls you together this day yearns for each of you and for all people to hear and be blessed. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Blessed is the one who comes bringing trustworthy words for the healing of the world. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Our opening hymn is Christ Be Beside Us, number 702. confess our sins to the Lord of all, who is gracious to all who call upon him. Holy God, you see into each of us and know us fully as creatures in need of your constant care. We confess that we have neither heard your word nor followed your will. We have failed our nation, neighbors, families, friends, and ourselves. Give us ears to hear your wisdom. Lead us to honesty and faith so that we may begin again with renewed strength in Jesus' name. We continue in silent confession. Join me in saying, in his name we pray, amen. God knows the hearts of those who seek forgiveness, and by grace you have been saved. In Jesus' name you are forgiven. Your sins are no more. You've been made clean. God strengthens you with freedom 
through the Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. First reading for the morning comes to us from 1 Samuel verses three, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 20. Now the boy was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. He got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel. That will, both, that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And 
all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. gospel reading for the morning comes to us from the gospel of John chapter 1 verses 43 to 51 the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee he found Philip and said to him follow me now Philip was from Bethsaida the city of Andrew and Peter Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said to him, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Does it sometimes seem to you like we don't hear that often from God these days, at least not any kind of a direct word? When we hear these stories that we encounter, we hear words from God that come to us from this rich heritage of the biblical text. But the stories that we hear are incredibly varied. When we hear this passage from 1 Samuel, it begins with a word that the word from God was rare in those days. Some interesting things were happening. There are some characters that are a part of this story that builds up to where we are, even though it's just the third chapter of Samuel. There was a man named Elkanah who had two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. Peninnah was the first wife. She was the one who was more highly honored. She had lots of children. Hannah, the second wife, had no children. And even though Elkanah seemed to favor her, God had chosen for her to be barren. So Hannah had something of a rough time. Children were signs of blessing. Children were signs that God was, in a sense, backing you. And so 
Hannah was without children. She decided instead of just resigning herself to that fate, that she would go and address God. She would ask God. She went to the temple to pray. When the priest found her there, he wanted to know what in the world she was doing because she was sitting kind of off to the side moving her lips silently the priest may have thought this woman is beside herself or drunk or something he went over to speak with her and she asked him not to not to bother her or to worry about her that she was praying he gave her permission to go ahead she was praying to god that she might have a child she was making a kind of promise to God, if you will give me a child, I will give this child to you as a gift. So sometime later, we begin to hear that Eli, the priest who is in charge of the temple, has become old. He has begun to lose his vision He's put his sons in charge of things, as was somewhat customary to do. And his sons are taking advantage of the place. All of the Israelites from, from all over were supposed to come there to worship. And these sons that Eli couldn't see very well, with his vision going dim, were taking advantage of people. They were hoarding the offerings to God for themselves, taking the fat offerings. The fat was the best. It was what you were supposed to burn and offer to God as a kind of incense. They were fattening themselves on it instead. And even worse, the women who were in charge of the doors at the temple were being sexually abused by them could imply that they were being raped on a regular basis by these sons who were supposed to be in charge of the temple, who were supposed to be caring for the gatekeepers and doing what was right, and they were not. Hannah had become pregnant and had had a child. His name was Samuel, and true to her word, she had brought Samuel to the temple for Samuel to serve. Samuel was there as a young boy serving Eli. That's when a word was spoken. In the middle of the night, as the old man slept, as Samuel rested he heard someone calling to him, Samuel, Samuel. Yes, Lord, he got up. He went to Eli, the old priest, to ask what it was he needed. I didn't call you, go back to, go back to sleep. Samuel, Samuel, he heard. Yes, what is it, you, you called me. Here I am. No, no, I, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. And then the old man realized, even though a word was rare in those days, that perhaps this was a word that was being spoken from God. Go back to bed, he said. It happens again know that it is the Lord that you are to listen. Listen to what he says. So Samuel went back to bed. He lay down, heard again, Samuel, Samuel, here I am, Lord. God spoke words to Samuel, difficult words, 
words about Eli and about his sons and how the house of Eli would no longer be in charge of the temple because they had not been faithful. Someone else would need to be in charge. Words. What does a priest have but words to speak to the flock, to speak to the people who are gathered there, words of assurance, words of blessing, words in the liturgy, words of the Psalms, words of the scriptures. But those words apparently were not being spoken in a truthful way. The words were not being served. What does a prophet have but words? Words to sometimes speak in difficult circumstances, words to correct the people, words to speak that maybe people don't want to hear, words that are to correct the people, that are to bring the leadership of the nation back into line to do the things that they are supposed to do, to do the right things. Rare was the word of the Lord in those days. But God spoke a word then. God spoke that word to this young boy, Samuel. The next day when Samuel got up, the old man called him in and said, tell me everything. Tell me everything that he said. Don't miss a word. I want to know it all. I can only imagine that Samuel did not want to speak those words. But he told the old man. He told them what God had spoken. That the house of Eli would be no longer someone else would be in charge because of all of the bad things that had been done, all of the untruthful things that had been exposed, all the ways the people had been abused and misled. The Hebrew word for words is dabar or dabar. Maybe you remember um, some words that are sometimes spoken. One of the one of the articles that sometimes goes in front of dabar is ka dabar. The words or the word. Sometimes we maybe hear some things like. Abra or Abra Kadabar or Kadavar Abra Kadabra. They're Hebrew words that became Yiddish words that became more common words that just mean the words Abra Kadabra, the words. God had a word to speak, and this word, davar, appears 23 times in the first of this text. God had a word to speak about what the people should be doing and the ways in which they would be corrected, that a new thing would be happening. When we move to the gospel reading for this morning, Gospel of John begins by saying, the Word made flesh. The Word came to dwell among us. The Word of God came to us. John speaks about the Word and describes the Word as Jesus Christ. The Word has come to us, the Word to speak truth to us 
And what happens in this passage? Jesus, the Word made flesh, begins to call out to people, begins to call his disciples, to call his followers, to come and be a part of what it is he's doing. Come and follow me, he says. Some of them get excited. Philip calls out to a friend, Nathaniel, and says, we have seen the one, the one whom we have heard about, the one who's been written about in the words of Moses, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? It's kind of a funny thing since Nazareth is, of course, a small town off the beaten path. It's not close to Jerusalem. It's way up in Galilee. It's not even close to the Sea of Galilee. And yet, the Word became flesh, came to that place, began to call them out to say, come, come and follow me. I wonder sometimes if maybe what Jesus overheard Nathaniel say was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? As they kind of tease each other and as Jesus challenges Nathaniel and says, I know that you're a truthful man. There's no deceit in you. Maybe what he's saying is, I know you were not being deceitful about Nazareth. You were being truthful. Come and follow me. Come and follow me in the way of truthfulness. Come and follow me as a disciple. Come and follow in the ways that I'm leading you to doing a, a new thing. Come and follow me as the word walks this way as the word goes on this journey through Galilee, as the word goes down to Jerusalem to face what in the end will be a difficult time, but will be a transforming word of God in the flesh who chooses to suffer in order to change the world. When these other disciples discover Jesus, tell them to come and see who he is, come and see what it is he's doing, they're challenged by that. They want to see. They want to see what this truth is. They want to see what the word is like in the flesh. They want to see this person who's been written about, spoken about, whom they have expected. If this is really the one So they come and see, they begin to follow. As we think back about the events of January the 6th, the day of Epiphany, the day when we are to have things revealed to us, when we are to see truthful things, there's some curious things that happen. Many of you probably already know about Officer Eugene Goodman, who was uh, in the Capitol that day, a Capitol Police officer. As people broke into the building and they began to run through the halls of Congress, trying to find their way to the Senate chambers, Officer Eugene Goodman challenged some of them pushed back on one of them who was leading, which was apparently a way of getting him to follow Eugene Goodman rather than to break away and to go into different parts of the building. He, he touched him just slightly, challenged him just slightly. The fellow who was coming up those stairs and leading the crowd followed Eugene Goodman if they'd gone to the left, they would have been going to the unsecured chambers of the Senate. 
but instead, quick thinking, Eugene Goodman told others on his radio where he was, where he was headed, what the situation was, and he guided them to the right instead, leading them down a different hallway, down to a different space where other officers would be able to confront them, to try to control them as best they could. It gave them just an extra minute, just enough time for the rest of the senators who were on that floor to be evacuated and taken to a safe place. Eugene Goodman said and did something that was wise and truthful. He put himself at risk to save the lives of others. After the big events of that day had quieted down, after Congress had taken the vote that they needed to vote, after they had begun to go on their way, Representative Andy Kim from New Jersey was walking through the building. It was a place that he had only served in for a couple of years, but he was incredibly devout, incredibly appreciative of that place. His parents were immigrants from Korea. They had made their way here, and he had grown up here. They had tremendous respect for the United States. And it was amazing to Andy that he had made his way up through the ranks of elected office to become a member of Congress. It was a great reverence that he thought of this building that he was able to serve in, to work in. And he was astonished at the things that had happened on that day. After most all of the members of Congress had gone home, Representative Kim was making his way through the rotunda. There were still guards, Capitol policemen around, but there were also janitors. Those janitors were cleaning, cleaning up the terrible mess that had been left behind broken glass, empty water bottles, discarded clothing, other kinds of things that had been damaged. Andy Kim went over to the janitors and asked if there was an extra bag. He got down on his hands and knees and began picking up trash, cleaning up the place trying to restore some order to what had been disordered. Andy Kim, a follower of Jesus Christ, one who also happens to be a Presbyterian elder, one who faithfully serves. There are times when we are called to be servants time when we are called to speak a difficult word, time when we are called to say to others, you must not do these things. You must do what is right. Time when we are to speak a word to those in leadership positions to challenge them, to bring them within line, to say, you are not to be involved in corruption. You are not to be involved in devastation. You are called to serve the people. You are called to do what is right. Andy Kim, Eugene Goodman, many other people in that place we're called to do what is right, just as we are called to follow the word of God.
to acknowledge the truthfulness of what it is God calls us to do, to do what is right and good for all of the nation, for all of the world. God speaks a word, sometimes to a woman who feels barren, as though she has no promise, and promise begins to grow. Sometimes God speaks a word to an officer who is overrun by people ready to be involved in destruction and harm. And he answers the call to do what is right. Sometimes we are called, like Representative Kim, to be a servant, maybe to bend down on our hands and knees, to pick up the mess, the brokenness, to restore things to the way they are supposed to be. Let us say what we believe. We trust in God, whom Jesus calls Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commands, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God makes us in Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. I messed up. Yep. Sorry. I, I got, I skipped a line and I think it's going to pick it up right here. If it didn't pick it up right here, I wouldn't care. I mean, we'd all be, I'm sorry. <laughs> Close yeah. Okay, we'll do it again. I'm sorry. That's no, fine. fine. I'll try not to skip a line. Okay. Let us say what we believe. We trust in God, whom Jesus calls Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people to live as one community. But we rebel against God, we hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. Loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant, like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. God is faithful still.
join together in a word of prayer. God, we come to you in thanksgiving for the ways that you are indeed faithful with us, faithful to us, for the ways that you continue to call us together to be people of truth, to be people of sacrifice, to be people who seek to faithfully serve you. We pray that your blessings would be with all of those who are sick, those who will need different kinds of intervention, medical procedures or treatments, surgeries, other kinds of things in the hopes of regaining wellness and wholeness. We pray for their strength and their perseverance. We pray especially as there are so many people who know the challenge of this virus, some who know only mild symptoms and others who know great devastation from it. We pray that we may search ourselves and look for ways to work together to be a part of taking on this challenge to putting this virus in its place not allowing it to spread so easily we pray for those who are longing for reassurance and for safety We pray especially at a time when our nation is in transition. We pray that we would know the reassurance of your loving presence, of the ways in which you would guide our leadership, the ways in which you would guide our communities, the ways in which you would guide us to do the things that are right and good. We pray that our nation would know indeed a new day, that we would be able to hear and understand and follow your word as you would lead us forward. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Friends, now let us give to God the Lord's tithes and our offerings.
The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. God, we come to you in thanksgiving for these opportunities to offer ourselves and our gifts to you. We pray that you would take us and use us in proclaiming your good news in every part of your creation. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Maker, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and in every moment of your living. The Lord be with us. The Lord be with us all. Oh, my God. 